I think we can get started. Welcome to my talk, Better Algorithm Intuition. It is the sequel to the first talk that I gave, Algorithm Intuition. Uh, my name is Connor Hookstra, and uh, the first thing I want to say uh, is a couple things that I, I saw from a tweet um, from an individual by the name of Lindsay, or handle is Little Cope. And she stated a couple things about how you can um, take sort of three actions to have uh, more inclusive talks. Um, so the first one is to uh, state your pronouns. Uh, the second is to include a link to your slides, not at the end of the talk, but at the beginning of the talk, so that um, those who might prefer to follow along on their laptops can do so. And also to have a tiny URL and read out that URL for uh, those that uh, might be able to hear better than they can see. So um, I'm going to do those following three things. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, the uh, link to my sort of full GitHub page where all of my talks are, are github.com slash co-report slash talks. And uh, the tiny URL, all in lowercase, is tiny.cc slash jo99fz. Um, uh, note, though, that uh, this is a very interactive talk. I'm going to be asking a lot of questions and hopefully getting some answers from the audience. There are spoilers in the slides. Uh, so if you are following along on your laptop, Try to track me as close as possible and don't go ahead. And if you accidentally do, do, do go ahead, try to refrain from answering uh, because there's a couple of uh, what I hope to be really difficult questions and I would like to see how many in the audience are able to, to solve those questions. Um, so uh, without further ado, we're going to uh, jump into the next part, which is my disclaimer that I put at uh, the beginning of all my talks, which is a, a total of two at this point. Um, I'm not an expert, I'm just a dude. This is a quote from a, a CPPCon talk in 2015 that Scott Schur give, uh, gave where he said the following. Turn the, turn the volume up. I can, I can hear it very faintly. Should I try one more time? Uh, yeah, we tested this before. Uh, well. We will move past this clip, and hopefully by the time we get to the next clip, the audio will be fixed. If not, we might need to do this talk without the audio clips, which will be unfortunate. Um, but yes, uh, he says that he's not an expert, he's not a dude, and that also if you ask or answer questions, you get candy. Uh, typically, when I'm in smaller rooms, I throw candy out. Uh, due to the size of the room, I will not be throwing candy out, but if you do ask or answer a question, see me after the talk. And uh, due to the fact that we're in Germany, I have some Polish candies. Um, and uh, you, you can collect one of those. Um, first come, first serve, obviously, if I run out. Um, so about me, uh, I am a senior library software engin engineer for NVIDIA. I work on an awesome team called the Rapids team. Uh, they work on putting data science on the GPU. And it's completely open source, so if you feel like contributing to an open source project and you're interested in you know, those buzzwords of GPU and data science, uh, feel free to check out the project at rapids.ai. Uh, I am a programming language enthusiast, so although I primarily develop in C++, I love all programming languages. I have about five plus years of programming uh, experience in C++. Note there's an asterisk there. That's because the first two to three years of my C++ experience involved zero standard data structures or algorithms. So everything that you're seeing up here, um, I learned and developed in the last couple years. Um, I love auto. I'm in the AAA club. Um, I also prefer East Cons. I've got my uh, two different East Cons bracelets. Uh, thanks to JetBrains for the uh, the second one. Um, and I've hidden one Const West, uh, candy to the individual who can find that uh, Const West in my presentation. Uh, I absolutely love algorithms. I'm uh, extremely excited to be here talking about algorithms once again in a different talk. And I love beautiful code. And uh, the final note is that I have a YouTube channel where I cover uh, solutions to a uh, variety of competitive programming problems across several different websites in different languages, C++, Python, Java, sometimes Rust, sometimes Haskell. So if you're interested, uh, check out that. So uh, the prequel to this talk, as I mentioned, Algorithm Intuition, it's available on C++ Now on their YouTube channel and also CppCon. I recommend the C++ Now talk uh, because it's half an hour shorter. Um, but uh, in these two talks, I provide motivation for why I'm giving this talk. And uh, I'm not going to give the full-blown you know, 10 to 15 minute motivation. If you'd like to see that, go back and watch this talk. But I am going to give an abridged version of that motivation in case you haven't seen those talks. Um, so it all started in 2013 with a talk that was given by Sean Parent at Going Native called C++ Seasoning, where he famously said the following. Oh. <laughs> uh, 
yeah, sh should we troubleshoot this or should I just go without audio? I'm sorry, I'm getting a sign from the back. Oh, we're going to troubleshoot it. Oh, yeah, it's said it's default. Let's try that again. That's a rotate. Hey, thank you. <laughs> All right, this will be much better. So he famously said that. Uh, he also said it uh, 24 more times. I sped this up at a 2.0 times speed, which had an unfortunate effect on his voice, so I apologize, Sean. Uh, but these are all of those instances. That's a rotate. 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 That's and this led to a trend over the next five to six years of many individuals referring back to this talk and mentioning the fact that we should all know our algorithms. Those individuals included Marshall Clow, Kate Gregory, Jonathan Bacara, and Odin Holmes. Is using standard algorithms. Because he knows the algorithms. We need to know all the SCL algorithms. I should go look in algorithm. Learn your algorithms. And these YouTube videos combined with the following quote from Kate Gregory on CPPCast episode 30, led to the motivation of this talk. And just as you can say, that would be a good use of a linked list, we don't have that intuition about algorithms yet, mm -hmm. and we need to. And that leads us to the goal of this talk. So hopefully, I can get you excited about algorithms, you might learn a new algorithm, and you can start to develop some intuition about algorithms. So prologue to this talk. This talk has six chapters. We're going to go through one to six. Uh, but the prologue is uh, talking about what I covered in the previous talk. So this is a numeric versus algorithm. I showed this table in my previous talk. There are 111 algorithms across the three headers, numeric, algorithm, and memory. In the first talk, I covered the algorithms in the numeric header. In this talk, I'm going to be covering a subset of the algorithms in the algorithm header. Uh, on a side note, uh, previously at the WG21 Belfast ISO C++ Standards Committee meeting, an individual by the name of Vincent Riverdi uh, posted this beautiful histogram, which is a histogram of the length of algorithm names. So the number of characters in every algorithm name. So it's pretty pretty. I'm just putting it up there because I like graphs. Uh, I used to work in Excel a lot. Uh, but more importantly, on the previous slide that he showed before this was a list of all of the algorithms with the length or the number of characters in each of the algorithm names. Uh, the reason I'm showing this is that he said there's 114 algorithms, uh, which concerned me because uh, previously Jonathan Bagar had said there was 104, and then I tried to state that he left out a couple, and really there's 111 up until uh, C++17, including C++17. And so I went through this list, and I found that there are indeed three that aren't on the lists uh, that I was looking at. So the first one is in the bottom right-hand corner, lexicographical compare three-way. That's a C++20 algorithm. And then there were two that were not in the three headers that I mentioned. So those are QSort and BSearch, which are in the C std lib header. So there are indeed, up until and including C++17, across the three headers, numeric algorithm and memory, 111 algorithms. So that brings us to chapter one. Every second chapter is going to be a chapter that focuses on leak code problems. Uh, so chapter one, chapter three, and chapter five. In this chapter, we're going to cover five problems, and each of these problems is solvable with a single STL algorithm. So I'm going to show you the problem. Just shout out the answer as soon as you think you know it, and if uh, I hear the right answer, we'll move on and look at the solution. So problem number one, write a function that reverses a string. I heard 20, 30 people say std reverse. So that is the correct answer, std reverse. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, Wow, I'm about to learn nothing over the next 60 minutes. This is extremely obvious. Well, oh, and I should also note in the bottom left-hand corner, there are analog algorithms. Uh, so uh, thrust is to CUDA what STL is to C++. So um, basically, uh, any time that there is an algorithm on the screen that there is also a thrust analog algorithm, it'll be in the bottom left-hand corner, just because I work for NVIDIA. Um, so like I said, you might be thinking, why am I showing this? Well, for every leak code problem, there's a forum where you can post your solution, and then similar to Reddit, people upvote and downvote based on uh, whether they like your solution or not. So uh, ideally, the best solutions will filter to the top. Let's take a look at the top C++ solution with over 25,000 views. It's, it's correct. I mean, it works. 
But it, it's, it's, not, it's not what we would, at least as an algorithm lover, uh, what, what I would hope for. So uh, let's take a look at uh, the next uh, you know, best solution. So now we're, we're taking the indexes and we're, we're declaring them outside. Uh, it's pretty verbose, but l l let's keep on looking until we find one that actually uses, you know, std reverse. Okay, this is getting better. We only have two lines, single for loop. We aren't declaring our indexes outside, and we're using std swap, similar to the first solution. This is the one that I thought, okay, C++ one-liner, here we go. This is going to be std reverse. They took the two-line solution and just put the contents of the for loop on the same line as the for statement. Okay. Um, but then I saw this one. One-line C++ code with the help of STL. They're calling it out, and I thought, here it's going to be. Stood reverse. We're calling the range constructor, taking two reverse iterators. So it's... It's, it's better than what we saw previously, but still not using std reverse. So the point here is that although many of you in the room know what std reverse does, there are many C++ developers out in the wild that have never even looked at the algorithm header. We should encourage our coworkers, even if we're introducing them to you know, std reverse or some simple algorithm, uh, hey, you can use this, because I think there's a lot of people that aren't even aware of it. So moving on to the next problem. Implement the function uh, to lowercase that has a string parameter str and returns the same string but in lowercase. Everyone shouted out, transform. So sure enough, this is a pretty straightforward problem. Uh, you're passing it two iterators uh, for your input range and then a single iterator for your output range and then calling the two lower function. Uh, so pretty nice. Uh, the equivalent of this in Haskell is map to lower. Those are two built-in functions. Uh, I just like to put Haskell slides in my uh, you know, talks because I love Haskell and it makes me happy. Um, and I think sometimes we can learn things from Haskell. So uh, problem number three, given an array, a of non-negative integers return an array consisting of all the even elements of A followed by the odd elements of A. You may return any answer that satisfies this condition. Partition. There was, once again, 20, 30, 40 people that yelled it out. So this is what our uh, std partition solution looks like. It takes a unary predicate, in this case in the form of a lambda, that's basically just checking, is our element uh, equal to, is it even? And we can do that with the modulus 2 operator. All of those elements are going to be put at the beginning, and then all of the odd elements are going to be put at the back. Um, so uh, an animation of what an implementation of this, uh, uh, of this algorithm might look like is the following. We have an iterator at the front, an itera iterator at the back, and what we're going to look for at the front is a block. So if in this case we're partitioning the pink blocks to the front, we want to find an element that fails that predicate. So we're going to look for a blue block at the front, and then a pink block at the back, and then we're going to swap them. And then we're going to continue to do that until we meet in the middle. So that's going to look like this. We found a blue block. Now we're looking for a pink block at the end. We've already found that block, and at this point we're going to swap. We're going to continue to do this. We found another blue block. At the back, we're going to look for a pink block. We're going to iterate until we find it. Here we go. Then we swap. Now it's partitioned. Um, and if you were in Ivan Kuchis's talk yesterday, Compile Time Type Transformation, I, I believe it was called, it was a fantastic talk. If you didn't get a chance, uh, I would definitely recommend going and checking it out on YouTube uh, when it's uploaded. Uh, he mentioned that this is actually referred to as the two-finger method, because basically you can take two fingers and go boop, 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 and then uh, you have the solution uh, to your, your partition algorithm. So uh, need to know. Uh, and this, once again, is the Haskell solution. They have a partition built in. Note that the partition in Haskell returns a pair of lists, so you have to concat those together in order to get the equivalent of the STL partition. Uh, problem number four. Given an array of nums, write a function to move all zeros to the end of it while maintaining the relative order of the non-zero elements. Shout it out. Uh, I heard one incorrect one, but we're going to come back to that, and the correct solution was stable partition. So this is very similar to partition, but it maintains the relative order of the elements in our list, where partition does not. Um, so this is great to know. And uh, once again, Haskell solution, uh, by uh, default, the partition that you get is a stable partition, so you don't need to do anything different here. And uh, last but not least for chapter one, uh, k closest points to origin. Uh, we have a list of points on the plane. Find the k closest points to the origin 0, 0. So you can imagine a, a Cartesian uh, plane like so, x and y axes. And it says, uh, you may return the answer in any order. The answer is guaranteed to be unique, except for the order that it is in. Now note that there's a couple algorithms that can be used to solve this. Uh, just shout out one of them if you think you know it. So I've, I've heard about 20 uh, shout outs of the exact same algorithm, which is the most efficient, and it is one of them. 
I heard, uh, so that was nth element, and I heard sort, which is also, and there's a third one. Does anybody know that one that can be used? Partial sort. So we're going to start with sort. And basically what we're doing here is we're taking uh, two iterators that define our range as our first two parameters. Then we have a comparator in the form of a lambda that's calculating the two uh, distances and then seeing if it's less. And then we're doing our sort based on that. And at the end, we're just returning a vector of the first k elements uh, in that uh, sorted range. So without changing the algorithm, there's a small optimization we can make here. Does anybody know what it is? I heard it a few times. It is removing the square root. So we can still maintain uh, our comparator uh, without doing the square root calculation. So as the crowd mentioned, partial sort can be used. So we don't need to sort all of the elements in our list. We only need to sort up until the first k, which we have uh, the exact algorithm for that, and that's partial sort. But the audience uh, overwhelmingly mentioned uh, for their first guest was nth element. And you can note the only thing that I changed there was the name of the algorithm. So if you don't actually need to have the first k element sorted, you can just use nth element. And this brings us to our first sort of relationship between uh, several different algorithms, which is std sort, std partial sort, and std nth element. Now, it sounded like everybody in the crowd knows this, but I'm sure that there's several people on YouTube that are going to be watching this later that didn't know this relationship. And uh, two years ago, I, I had no idea about this. Like, sort and partial sort's a bit obvious, but nth element is completely not obvious if you don't know what it does. Um, so this is great to know. So, so far, or, and yes, uh, we're actually going to watch a clip from Kate Gregory, who comments uh, on another form of partial sort, which is partial sort copy. Partial sort copy, which does what it says on the tin. It gives you a copy, a smaller collection, that is just the things that would have been at the front, and it leaves your original collection in its original order. You don't want to sort your vector. This is not the right name for this. I'd like to see it called Top N. I am delighted it is there. I wish it had another name. Do not tell me to write a paper. <laughs> so Kate Gregory remarks that she thinks partial sort copy should be called Top N. However, she also just said that we don't need the elements to be sorted. So this actually isn't the right name for partial sort copy. Top N is the right name for nth element copy. And if we wanted to name partial sort copy similar to top n, we would want to call it top n sorted. And we've made this mistake before. Does anybody know where? It's not in the algorithm world. It's actually in the data structure world. Yes, I heard it. Map and an order. Our set by default is a hash set. In Python, it's the exact opposite. The set and the map that they get, or I guess they don't really have a map right out of the box, uh, but the set that they get is a hash set. And if you want a sorted set, you have to go to a different collection that's called a sorted set. Um, but I'm not sure what the history is here, but in my opinion, the having to put unordered underscore before set uh, is, is, is doesn't make as much sense. Like, there are some extra information implicitly within set that as C++ developers, we need to know about. And, you know, we, we can't go and change this, but... Uh, going forward, we should try not to make these mistakes again. Uh, so we've seen eight algorithms so far. Reverse, stable, partition, transform, and element for each sort, partition, and partial sort. Now, two of these algorithms don't rely on swap. Don't rely on swap. Can you shout out the two? For each and, and transform. That is correct. One of the remaining six algorithms that does rely on swap, if we switch that swap to a move, and make one other small change, we get a different algorithm, which I actually heard earlier. Remove if. So stable partition, and I assume if you're saying remove if, because that's the correct answer, uh, is related to stable partition. You can think about this as we're separating our range into two partitions, and in the stable partition sort, the one that fails the predicate goes to the back. In the remove if case, the one that passes the predicate goes to the back, but we're doing moves instead of swaps. So the back of the array is, less, is left in an unspecified state. So if you're ever using stable partition and you actually don't care about the second partition, you should be using remove if. And that's the second relationship that we're covering in this talk. So that brings us to chapter two. This is a abridged version of the original chapter two because this was originally a 90 minute talk and I only have 60 minutes. Uh, but the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at another Kate Gregory clip uh, from the same talk. Which is the There's a little algorithm header love club, which has had meetings this week, I have to say. And you know, you know who we are. Did you guys hear that? 
There's a little algorithm header love club. There's a little algorithm header love club. I gave two talks now, one 90 minutes, one two hours, and I'm in the middle of another talk on algorithms, and I didn't know about this club. So I went looking for it. Sure enough, they've got a Twitter page. Algorithm Love Club, that's algo underscore love underscore club. They've got 100 plus followers and they haven't sent out a single tweet. Uh, so I followed them and you can join the club too. So go to algo underscore love underscore club uh, to follow them on Twitter. And I'm sure at some point they're gonna start tweeting about some wonderful uh, algorithm things. Um, so that's the first sort of Twitter thing. The second thing that I, I had a longer form version is that I, I, as you can tell, I steal a lot of content from other previous talks and uh, codes and slides from other people. So uh, implicitly, they all got shout outs in my first talk, but I wanted to explicitly give them a shout out in this talk, referring back to my uh, prequel. So all of their handles are here. And what I had originally shown was uh, sort of concatenating these two lists of which some people show up on both. And then I wanted to basically rank uh, the individuals based on the number of Twitter followers that they had. But before I did that, I had to remove the, du the duplicate names. Uh, so I'm not going to show you that problem, um, but does anybody know if in place we want to remove duplicates, what two algorithms we have to use? Yes, I heard 20, 30 people say it. It is std sort plus std unique. So std unique removes adjacent duplicate elements. And if we sort before we do that, we know that all of the equal elements are going to be next to each other. So it's an in-place way to remove all duplicates. And uh, the next slide here is I have uh, showing, I think, 10 languages in total, what uh, different languages call these algorithms. And it's, it's really unfortunate. So R stood unique, almost every other language calls this dedupe, which I actually find counterintuitive because the actual remove duplicates algorithm, which is where, regardless of order, you're ending up with just unique values, uh, is typically called either unique or distinct. So Elixir, Ruby, D, Rust, they all call it unique. And F Sharp, Clojure, and Kotlin, and Scala, they call it distinct. And then R unique, they call dedupe. So anyways, if you're going to other languages, it's just useful to know this. And of course, Haskell got it right. They called it sort unique, uh, which is exactly what we're doing in C++, which is why I love both C++ and Haskell so much. All right, chapter three. Uh, we're going back to leak code here. We have a couple more problems. We're getting a little bit more uh, difficult now. Each of these problems is solvable by two algorithms, not one. So it's going to take a little bit more time. Let's take a look at problem number one. Given an array of integers a sorted in non-decreasing order, return an array of the squares of each number also in sorted non-decreasing order. And note, we have to take a look at the details for this question. And if you see number two, it says that the values of our elements can be between negative 10,000 and 10,000, which is going to inform our solution. So shout out uh, either of the two algorithms if you think you know one of them to help solve this problem. I heard transform. That is the first algorithm. And pretty obviously, the second one is sort. Don't worry, they're going to get harder. Uh, so of course, we're just calling a std transform with a, new, a unary operator in the form of a lambda that's squaring our value, and then we just call sort. Nothing fancy here. Next problem. Oh, actually, so I've done this a couple times uh, where I've, I've showed different formatting. So I, I've pulled twice. The uh, results were opposites, uh, both of the first two times. So between these two formatting, for, for slideware, not for production code, but for, for slideware, who prefers uh, this formatting? Raise your hand. And who prefers this formatting? So that was about three to one in favor of the vertical formatting, whereas this is the horizontal. And it's a trick question. You should all prefer this formatting. Um, C++ 20 ranges is coming. Uh, we don't get the ranges too, but the transform, and we also don't get the action, the sort. But uh, this is the equivalent solution in uh, C++ 20 ranges. Uh, and RV, uh, you know, I guess Bryce and I have to sync. He uses a different syntax, std r and std v. I prefer rv and ra, but uh, we'll sync up on that later. Uh, question. So the comment from the crowd is this can also be so solved by merge, find if, and transform. Yeah, let's think afterwards. Uh, I am not going to solve that solution, uh, but I uh, believe that there are multiple solutions, and what you're saying is probably correct. Yeah, we'll think afterwards. In place merge. I'm sure that there's several ways to solve this, yeah. So come find me. I love talking about this stuff. If we talk afterwards, I could talk for hours about this stuff. So once again, Haskell solution. Uh, very beautiful, very concise. Um, next problem. In an array A of size 2n, uh, there are n plus 1 unique elements. So I've actually changed this problem to be the following. 
In array A of size n, there are n minus 1 unique values. Therefore, exactly one of those values appears twice. Note that these are not sequential values. These are just random values. Uh, so the question is asking us to return the value that is repeated twice. So the, the uh, comment from the crowd was accumulate plus sort. So uh, And one row back, uh, I heard uh, adjacent find, which is the uh, best solution. So yes, you can, uh, you can implement uh, adjacent find in terms of an accumulate, but it's a little bit more declarative to use adjacent find. So the solution is to first sort your range, and then once again, one of the properties of a sorted range is that all of the equal elements will be next to each other. So the one element that appears twice, we know those will be right next to each other. And then there's an algorithm called adjacent find. And what that does is it takes a single range, it looks at adjacent elements, and then it applies a binary predicate to those two adjacent elements, and it returns you an iterator to the first of, the, of those pairs where the binary predicate first returns true. And by default, the binary operation that comes with adjacent find is stood equal to. So that's exactly what we want right here. You could overload it and you know, have a binary operator that you know, looks for elements where the difference is 10 or you know, less than or equal to or anything, but, but the default binary operation is equal to, so we can just use both of sort and adjacent find right out of the box, which is fantastic. And once again, this is the Haskell solution. Uh, so beautiful, I, I just love Haskell, but we're not gonna talk about it. Um, <laughs> suppose an array uh, sorted in ascending order is rotated at some pivot point unknown to you beforehand. You are given a target value, and we're going to simplify this problem, and you just have to return true or false of this, if this value exists. And uh, there's two extra things to note. You may assume that there are no duplicates, which actually does make the problem quite a bit harder. Uh, and your algorithm's runtime complexity has to be log n. So. I have one binary search. That is one of the two algorithms. And uh, the second algorithm that I've heard is lower bound, which is a binary search, which potentially could work, but it's not immediately obvious to me how it would work. But something similar to that is needed. I've heard it a couple times. Uh, and I'm going to say it in a sec, because it's not the first one that I have on my slide. And if you just attended. Um, uh, Dennis's talk on optimizing generic algorithms, he spent a whole third of his talk talking about it, which I was surprised to see. Uh, so the first uh, solution that is linear runtime due to the second algorithm, or the first algorithm is sorted until, uh, this is the general idea. So we have F and L, which just points to the begin and end of our range, and then we want to find that point where it's been rotated at. So we have sort of two halves to our, our, our range, and then we're just going to call binary search on the half where we know our target value is. So we can pair the target value to the first value. If it's larger than it, we know it's in the first sort of partition. And if it's less, then we know it's in the second partition. So we just perform one of those two binary searches where we pass sort of the F to the point where it's rotated at or P uh, to the last. Uh, and the algorithm that I heard that improves upon this is the fifth log N algorithm that most people don't pay attention to. So the ones that everyone know are binary search, lower bound, upper bound, the fourth one that a lot of people forget about is equal underscore range, but then there's a fifth algorithm, and it stood partition point. Partition point basically does exactly what isn't sorted until does, except that it's comparing elements to see at which point does the element on the left pass the predicate, the unary predicate that we have, and the one on the right fail the predicate. At that point, we know we have our partition point. But this is a log n algorithm. You can basically just perform a binary search, uh, you know, checking elements, and it sometimes it's going to return true for both of them, and sometimes it's going to return false for both of them. And we're looking for the point where we get one true, one false, and that's our partition point. So with this, we have our log n algorithm. And you can simplify this a bit, or maybe it's not simplifying, depending on your opinion, by using std bind and std greater equal. Um, and and I just I absolutely love the solution. And when I realized because uh, I, I had initially solved this with is sorted until, realized it wasn't efficient enough, and then hand-coded my own, because I wasn't aware of stood partition point at the time. Or I, I believe I was aware of it, I just didn't know it was log n. Um, and I think a lot of people don't know that it's log n, so it's important to know this, because um, it's a great algorithm. And I think it's a shame that we, we don't have more documentation that sort of just groups all of the log n algorithms in the STL header, because it completely goes ignored, I think, most of the time because of that. Chapter 4. 
So this is where, in my opinion, the talk gets more exciting. Uh, one, because we're talking about Haskell, and I love Haskell so much. Uh, but also, too, uh, the problems are going to get a lot more difficult from here, and I think the insight's a lot more important. Um, so there is a user group in the Pacific Northwest of the United States of America called the Northwest C++ User Group. And in my opinion, this user group at one point had four horsemen. And those four horsemen are the following individuals. Andre Alexandrescu, Walter Bright, and these individuals are known for working on what language? The D language, yes. So Walter Bright is the creator of this language, and Andre is one of the uh, top developers. I'm not sure, maybe he's the lead developer on this language. Um, and Eric Niebler, the third individual, uh, he is the individual behind the Ranges V3 library, which is uh, uh, you know, a lot of the test grounds for what is becoming C++20 ranges and C++23 ranges. And the fourth individual on the right is Bartosz Maluski. And this individual wrote a very well-known book called Category Theory for Programmers. And all, of, all four of these individuals started in C++ Topia. But you know, two of them have gone off and created a new language. And Bartosz has gone off and is promoting you know, the good word of functional programming and category theory. And this was alluded to in a C++ Now 2019 talk that was given by Odin Holmes. I mean, I've seen this with my friends, too, this kind of behavior where as soon as they start dabbling in functional programming, they, they don't really come back, right? And, and the reason for this is obviously that the functional <laughs> programming community <laughs> have some really hard drugs. <laughs> so uh, if you guys haven't picked up on this by now, that is the Haskell logo. And I asked Odin, I was like, you didn't really put a, a, a picture of you know, drugs on yours. And he's like, no, that was just my intern. He just took some sugar. Um, so, so don't worry. Um, but, but the point here is that uh, he's mentioning that as soon as some individuals have started dabbling in FP, they, they never come back. And he's referring to, I think, in part, to Bartosz Maluski. Uh, Bartosz has a number of C++ talks where he focuses on functional programming, specifically template metaprogramming, which is a Turing complete language inside of C++ that is completely functional. Um, and uh, he has a, a quote where basically on a podcast, he says the following. It's a way, so understanding functional programming was like a, a shortcut for you to be able to understand template metaprogramming? Yes, like yeah. Being able to think in Haskell, but write in C++ was your advantage. Yeah, and then I even started talking to C++ programmers, saying that even if you program in C++, it's a good idea to learn some Haskell. And a couple seconds later, he went on to say this. If, if you solve your problem first in Haskell, and then uh, you translate it into C++, you will probably get better quality code. Now, I'm not sure I completely agree with that, and I'm sure there are many times if you try and convert uh, Haskell into C++, uh, you're not going to end up with better quality code. But I think the exercise is, is very enlightening, and you can make a lot of realizations and insights about your C++ code by doing this. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, I'm not going to walk through this problem uh, in depth because I covered it in my previous talk. I will read it, and we'll show the C++ solution first. But the point is not to understand the solution to this problem. The point is to compare the C++ solution to the Haskell solution. So this problem states, given n non-negative integers representing an elevation map where the width of each bar is 1, compute how much water it is able to trap after raining. So basically, if you look at all of the black bars, you can look at these black bars as sort of uh, defining a, mountain a mountainous range. And if you imagine that the, the blue water isn't there to begin with, if it starts to rain, the question is asking, how much water can that mountainous range catch? And uh, the solution to this is basically to first identify the maximum and then to do what's called a scan from left to the maximum and then from right to the maximum and to basically uh, calculate the top line right here. Uh, so you're going to end up with 2, 2, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 5, 4, 4, 4, uh, 1. Or sorry, that's 1 at the beginning. So I was counting in 2. So divide everything I just said by 2. Um, and then once you have that, subtract it from the black. So you end up with the top of this range minus the black, and that's going to equal the amount of water that you could catch. So the C++ code in C++17 looks like the following. So if you've seen my previous talk, you're already familiar with the solution. I'd recommend going back and checking out the previous talk if you haven't. Um, but basically what we're doing on the second line here, we're uh, calculating the max element, and then we're doing two inclusive scans. That's uh, with the binary operation of max at the end here. And we scan first from left to the maximum. And then our second inclusive scan is scanning with reverse iterators, so from the right to the maximum. And that defines our, the top of our range. 
And then on the very last line, we're doing a transform reduce. That's uh, the C++17 equivalent of inner product. And the uh, transformation binary operation that we're using is std minus. So we're taking the difference between those two ranges. And then our reduction binary operation that we're using is std plus. So then we're adding all that water up together. So like I said, you don't need to completely understand the solution if you're scratching your head thinking this guy is going way too fast. Uh, I probably am going too fast. But the point is, you only need to notice what algorithms are we using. So we're using first max element to calculate the maximum, then two inclusive scans, and then a single transform reduce. So now let's solve this in Haskell and see if we can see the similarities. So here's our Haskell uh, type signature. Uh, we're starting off with a list of integers and then ending up with a single integer. So the list of integers represents our range. The final integer represents the amount of water. And what's the first thing we need to do? Calculate the maximum. Very simple. X is, is our original sort of mountainous range. So M is now equal to maximum. The next thing we need to do is find the index. We just do that by doing a length take well. We don't really need to spend too much time on that. Now we need to split our uh, range into two sort of partitions based on that index. So A, you're going to do take I, which takes the first I elements. B, you're going to drop I, that's going to take the last elements after that. And then YS is going to be our sort of top of our uh, mountainous plus a water range by doing a scan max. Uh, you can note there, there's an L in the first scan and an R in the second scan. So scan L is scanning from the left, scan R is scanning from the right. Um, and, and then once we have y's, we can basically just take the difference between y's and x's, and that's going to give us a range of our water, and then we just need to sum up those values to get the total amount of rain. So this is pretty nice. There's a couple optimizations we can make here. For those of you, just raise a hand that you consider yourself a novice in Haskell. Wow, that was like 30% of the room. Um, yeah, thumbs up. That's awesome. 70% uh, of you, you should uh, join the club. Um, but so there's a couple optimizations that some of the 30% might be noticing here. When you do a take and a drop together, there's an algorithm for that, split at. Uh, and when you do a split at and a take while together, there's an algorithm for that too. It's called break. So not only should you know your STL algorithms, regardless of the language you're in, you should know your algorithms. Because a lot of times you can write really, really expressive code by knowing all the algorithms. Um, so now we're going to compare this to our original solution. So the first algorithm we're going to try and find is the inclusive scan. This is pretty obvious. It's just the two scans at the bottom of our solution here. So that takes care of inclusive scan. The max element, once again, is pretty obvious. It's just the maximum right here. So that takes care of two of our three algorithms. The last one we have left is transform reduce. It's not obvious that there's a transform reduce here, but really at the end of the day, transform reduce is just two algorithms composed together, a transform and a reduce. So can anyone shout out what the reduce operation is? So yes, sum is the reduce, and transform is what? Zip width. That's interesting, because on a previous solution, I had covered how transform was math. So how can one algorithm be the equivalent of two algorithms in another language. So here are the two type signatures in Haskell for zip width and math. Note that when I say type signature, I just mean function declaration. So in C++, we call it a function declaration. In C, we call it a function prototype. In Haskell, they call it a type signature. So here are the two type signatures for the Haskell functions. Um, and we can line them up, line them up a little bit more. And we can also color code it, so that's, that's great. And so now we've got our two functions. Map takes a list of A's and a unary operation that changes your A to C, and then you end up with a list of C's. Pretty straightforward. Zip width does something very similar, but instead of taking one range, it takes a list of A's and B's, a binary operation that takes an A and a B and returns you a C, and then you end up with a list of C's. I, I've, I've skated over um, the fact that the, the very last thing you see in the type signature is the return value for this algorithm. Everything else you see, the n minus 1, uh, other things before that are the parameters for this uh, function. So what does this mean? This means that map and zip width from Haskell and most functional programming languages is std transform in C++. This is extremely important, at least for me. If you can cache this and grok this, you will start to use std transform way more than you used to. Most people forget about the two-range version, or at least I personally forget about the two-range version of transform. And in functional programming languages, they call them two completely different things, not related at all. Map and zip width are two incredibly different things. And the beautiful thing about zip width is that it explicitly 
calls out the fact that you're doing a zip operation inside your algorithm. And if you watched my, my previous talk where I talked about inner product and transform reduce, there's an implicit zip happening there that it, it takes a little bit of you know, uh, insight in order to realize that, that that's what's happening there. So cache this and use std transform both for when you're mapping and for when you're zip widthing. And I think that brings us to chapter five. So this, uh, we're gonna quickly cover the result of a problem without looking at the problem, uh, which is the following. So uh, I'm just quickly mentioning this because I probably don't have time to look at the problem, that when you have find if and you have a sorted range, you can upgrade this to a lower bound or an upper bound. And this was called out by Sean Parent in the same talk that I mentioned earlier, C++ seasoning. That's a find if. Maybe you might think implies that this stuff is sorted. Well, if you read the actual function, you would find that yes, in fact, everything except for the item we're looking for is in sorted order. And now we can replace the find if with a lower bound, and we can do a binary search for that guy. So the problem that I'm not showing right now, because I don't have time, I did this exact mistake. I've watched this talk, I've talked about it in talks that I've given previously, and then I wrote a find if and didn't realize until later that, oh wait, this is all sorted, I can use a lower bound. So in code reviews, when you see find ifs, ask yourself the question, is the range that I'm operating on sorted? And then you can potentially upgrade this to a lower bound or an upper bound. So once again, find if, uh, look out for this. So this brings us to the one question of this chapter that we're gonna look at, and it's my favorite of all the leak code problems we've looked at. Uh, and it's called reverse only letters. Given a string S, return the reverse string where all characters that are not a letter stay in the same place and all letters are reversed in their positions. So an example is if we're given the uh, input string one A, B, two C, D, the one and the two stay in the same location that they're in, but the A, B, C, D are reversed so that you end up with one D, C, two B, A. So the question is, how many algorithms do we need to solve this? So, you know, chapter one, we had one algorithm, Chapter three, we had two algorithms. This one, I'm not telling you. You have to guess. We'll do a show of hands. Think about it for a second. Okay, that was a second. All right. <laughs> so who thinks it's solvable with one algorithm? Raise a hand. I saw one person put his hand up halfway, saw no one else, and put it right back down. Uh, so, and we've got one person over there. So 1.5 people think it's solvable with one. Who thinks it's solvable with two? I see about, I don't know, 15 hands, 10 hands. Who thinks it's solvable with three? That's definitely the most so far, probably 40 or 50. And who thinks it's solvable with four? Nobody. Okay, so we will start with three. Uh, but before I show you the solution, do you guys wanna shout out uh, any of the algorithms that you think might be one of those three that we can use to solve this? I heard std transform, partition copy, Reverse is definitely one of them. Sorry, what was that? I can't hear that. Oh, copy, copy if, yes. So the first one is copy if, the second one is reverse, and the third one is to transform. So we're basically copying first the letters, and we have those now in a string called letters. Now, we're basically gonna reverse the letters in that string that we just created of just the letters, and then we're gonna transform, and what we're gonna do th is when we transform, we're gonna check, is this currently a letter that we're looking at? And then we're gonna copy a letter from our letter string into that, and then have a sort of index or uh, iterator that's pointing into that letter string that we're then gonna increment each time that we find a letter and do a copy. So that basically you're copying or replacing each of the letters in your original string with the reverse strings from your string letters. So we can delete one of these three algorithms to get two algorithms. Does anybody know which of these algorithms we can delete? Reverse is definitely correct. So we can just use copy if with reverse iterators. So now we're down to two. Can we get to one? We had 1.5 people that thought so. So what we really want is an algorithm that doesn't exist in the STL algorithm header. Does anybody know what algorithm that is? So it doesn't exist, you have to make it up. Reverse if. You can get a candy afterwards, come see me. So this is the algorithm that we want, but it doesn't exist, unfortunately. But let's see if we can implement it. So this is not working code. Do not go and copy this. Uh, it is completely broken, um, but it, it's just trying to illustrate the basic idea. So we've got uh, two iterators, first and last, and a predicate that's checking in this case, you know, uh, do we, are we looking at a letter, is it alpha? 
and then we have a while loop while first is not equal to last, and then two inner while loops. That's basically trying to see, um, as long as we aren't looking at a, a letter currently, uh, you know, iterate forward, move forward. And then um, uh, for the last, we're doing the same thing, but we're moving backward. And so once we have two letters, then we just swap them, and then we continue to do this algorithm. So a more complicated version of this, which is still wrong. Don't copy this code. Uh, there's bugs in it. Uh, but this is a, a little bit closer to a working solution. Uh, might look like this. Now, does anybody in the crowd know an algorithm that has a similar implementation to the algorithm that I, I just described? Partition. I heard it two or three times. So partition, as we saw before, we have an iterate at the front, an iterate at the beginning, and we're trying to find at the front one that fails the predicate and at the back one that passes the predicate. So here we're trying to get the pink blocks to the front, so we continue to do this. We have a blue one, now we have a pink one, we swap them, we're done. In the case of reverse if, we basically want to find two elements that pass our predicate and then swap those. So if we're trying to swap the blue elements, we're going to iterate once, and then at the back we're going to decrement once, and now we're going to swap those two. And then we're going to continue and do continue to do this until we've swapped all of the elements that pass our predicate. So can we write a tricky lambda that basically mimics this behavior with star std partition? I wouldn't be talking about it if I couldn't. So std partition. We're passing it two iterators that defines our string, in this case. And in our lambda, we have b, which is a Boolean flag, which basically every time we are able to match our predicate at the front, it toggles it. So it's going to put a not at the back, where typically you're going to look for an element that's passing your predicate. Uh, you're going to ha have the opposite behavior now. And this works. Thank you. <laughs> Either the crowd is confused or the crowd is not impressed. Um, this, was, uh, this was a great Sunday for me. Uh, <laughs> when I realized this, uh, it, was, it, it just made me so happy. So uh, obviously this is broken if uh, the implementation of your std partition doesn't start at the front and then go to the back and sort of do the two-finger method that Ivan Kuchich pointed out. Ivan, Ivan Kuchich. Um, but in the case uh, uh, on LeetCode, they are using a compiler that uh, has this behavior, and I also tested it on MSVC, and it, it completely works. So I wouldn't recommend writing code like this, but uh, this made me start to believe that you know, after developing intuition of just about the way that algorithms behave, then going and looking at the implementations and like coding them all from scratch is going to lead to more insights about you know, dotted lines between algorithms. Like I, I would never think that std partition and std reverse if have anything to do with each other. But if you start to think about the way that they're implemented, you're going to start to see these dotted line relationships, which I, which I think personally is just uh, is so cool. So uh, how many algorithms? One. So the individual at the back there and then the individual that put his hand up and then put it back down, you were half right. Um, and that takes us to uh, the final chapter of this talk. Chapter 6, which we're going to call uh, the Sean Parent Game. And I'll explain why it's called the, the Sean Parent Game uh, in a bit. But the way this game works is that I'm going to state an algorithm, and then uh, the crowd has to try and figure out uh, what algorithm this algorithm is implementable in terms of, if that makes sense. So, so similar to how, uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say that example, because that could give some hints. So anyways, we'll take a look at uh, first, std is sorted. So can anyone think of an algorithm? that we can use to implement. <laughs> I heard std rotate. That is not correct. So I've heard a correct answer, but I'm looking for something actually that's more directly obvious. Um, yes, is sorted until. So is sorted until is going to return us an iterator that points to the part at which uh, the element in which our range uh, is no longer sorted. So if we know it gets to the end of the range, we know we have a sorted range, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so I believe uh, this is the MSVC code. You can see here that we have a is sorted, and it is indeed impl implemented in terms of an is, in sorted, uh, is sorted until. So you can uh, ignore all of the noise. The point here that I'm just trying to point out that uh, MSVC, at least, uh, definitely implements is sorted uh, in terms of is sorted until. So now, uh, this was the algorithm that I heard uh, primarily. Uh, is sorted until is implementable in terms of 
adjacent find. So yes, the algorithm that we talked about earlier that looks at adjacent elements from a single range can be used if we overload the default binary operation of std equal to with std uh, less equal less uh, than or equal to. Uh, so as long as it's the two elements are equal to or the one on the left is less than the one on the right, we know we have a sorted range. Um, so the question then becomes, well, I think actually I have some code that, uh, that shows uh, the differences between these two algorithms. So MSVCs is sorted until looks like this. Adjacent find looks like this. If I go back and forth a couple times, you don't really see too much different. And we can actually take a look at the diff here. So uh, the top line is just the difference in the names of the algorithms. Uh, the second line, or the second and third line, are, is just a comment. So we can ignore the first chunk. And then uh, in our for loop, we're just incrementing slightly differently, but it's the same behavior. And then uh, the very last line is just the assignment of a, different named, a differently named variable. And so that means that the only thing that's different between these two is the order that the parameters are passed to the predicate. So that's the second last green and uh, red line here. So that means that we can very easily implement is sorted until in terms of adjacent find, which would just look like the following. So the only thing that we need here basically uh, is we're just you know, passing along the first and last to our adjacent find algorithm, and then we just need to flip the order in which the predicates are evaluated with our binary operation. And uh, you can make use of uh, boost HANA's flip function, which is a very nice utility. So thank you to Luby Dion, who's a fellow Canadian who wrote this library. Um, so that brings us back to this. And the game does not end here. There is one algorithm uh, <laughs> that can be used to implement a JSON find. Um, and no one, until right now, <laughs> has been able to identify that algorithm. And the reason it's called the Sean Parent game is because up until this point, everyone that I've asked hasn't been able to identify that algorithm. So congratulations, you're now in a small boat with Sean Parent. Um, and this algorithm is what I considered the worst named algorithm in the STL algorithm header, std mismatch. std mismatch takes two ranges, oh, I didn't uh, click on it. So std mismatch takes two ranges and is going to return you a pair of iterators to the first pair of iterators across the two ranges that fails to meet a predicate. So the default is equal to, so it's going to return you the first pair of iterators that aren't equal to. So this looks like if, if the first line is our first range and the second line is our second range, we're going to you know, increment this equal to still, equal to still, not equal to, at this point, it's going to return you a pair of iterators that are pointing into both of these two ranges. So the way that we can implement adjacent find is by doing the same zip tail mechanism where our first range is the first 0 to n minus 1 elements, and our second range is the second to n elements, and then we effectively have adjacent pairs of elements. And uh, the only thing we have to account for is the fact that there is an internal not happening here. Um, which is uh, a little bit unfortunate. So uh, this would be a sample implementation of adjacent find. Uh, you can see once again, uh, we're just defining our, our range here. This is similar to the inner product example from my previous talk. So this is the zero to the n minus one elements, the first two stood previous of last. And then we're defining the start of our second range with stood next. And then you can see inside our lambda here, uh, we basically have our binary uh, predicate, but we have a not in front of the pred. And thanks to uh, Michael Park, who pointed out that in C++17, we have a function that does exactly like this. And it's uh, std not func, which then drastically simplifies the code, in my opinion. And uh, this could be a valid implementation of adjacent uh, find. Um, unfortunately, uh, std mismatch is just, just an awful name. So oh yeah, thank you to Michael Park. Um, I think mismatch should be called zip find, because that's effectively what's happening. Technically, std mismatch is zip find not, but if we had zip find, we could very, very simply implement mismatch in terms of that. Uh, some might argue that we should call this transform find to be consistent with transform and transform reduce. I would argue that zip find shouldn't have, obviously, the one range version. It should only take the two range version, and then there's going to be no confusion in sort of you know whether we have uh, um, parity with the transform and transform reduce algorithms. So if we had zip find, we could implement mismatch this way um, by putting the not fun in front of this. And then that, that way, when we were implementing adjacent find, we wouldn't have to put the not fun here. 
Um, so that's fantastic. Maybe I'll write a proposal. Maybe I won't. And uh, this brings us to all of the algorithms that implicitly have zips. So mismatch has a zip. There's three others, technically four. Uh, shout them out. Yes, you got them all. You're not, you're not allowed to answer anymore. So let's do that again. The ones that uh, implicitly have zip. Transform and transform reduce. Yes, so transform is zip width. Transform reduce and AKA the C++11 version inner product is zip reduce. Note, I don't advocate for calling them zip reduce. You can just think of the two range versions as zip reduce and for transform zip width. And there was a fourth one, if you, if you consider inner product and transform reduce the same algorithm that was mentioned by the individual in the front row, which is equal. So equal takes two ranges and just returns you true or false based on whether those ranges are equal. Um, I have a sample implementation here using zip reduce where your transformation operator is equal to and your reduction operation is logical and. Um, however, I took a look at uh, the MSVC code. They don't do this. Um, they just sort of hand roll their own for loop. Um, but I did find an implementation that does rely not on zip reduce or transform reduce, but on mismatch. Anyone have a wild guess on who wrote this code? Alexander Stepanov. For those of you that don't know, he is the father of the standard template library and is the original author of all of the STL code. So in his original implementation that you can find at his website, stepanovpapers.com, I highly recommend, even if you don't want to take a look at the source code, all of his papers, all of his works are on that website. It's a great website to check out, but if you go specifically to that file, you'll find uh, stood equal uh, implemented in terms of stood mismatch. And, and note that this is an algo base. He has two headers, algo.h and algobase.h. And you can read into this what you will, but he considered both equal and uh, mismatch sort of the, the base algorithms. Uh, so clearly, he knew how useful std mismatch was. Um, and this is uh, just, I formatted this. Uh, this is actually how he formats it, but I prefer the vertical styling for, for slideware. Um, so equal can actually be implemented in terms of std mismatch by just checking to whether uh, the iterators are pointing to the end. And there are a number of other two range algorithms that don't rely on zip. They're at the bottom, includes merge, search, uh, the set algorithms, and swap range. And uh, last but not least, you know, std mismatch, I think should be called zipfine, the worst named algorithm. The second worst named algorithm I covered in my last talk, which was adjacent difference. I think this should be called adjacent transform. And that brings us to all of the algorithms that we covered in this talk. Note that there's a few grayed out ones. If I ever give the 90 minute version of this, um, I'll be covering those as well. And uh, that brings us to the conclusion. So in chapter one, we cover the relationship between sort, partial sort, and end element, and the relationship between remove if and stable partition. Uh, chapter two, we covered how you can uh, remove all the duplicates from your list by combining sort and unique, and you should go follow uh, Algo Love Club and all of the individuals that I stole content to from in my last talk. Chapter three, we uh, talked about the relationship between is sorted until and partition point and pointed out that partition point is the fifth log n algorithm next to the other binary search algorithms. Um, chapter four, we talked about how transform is basically both map and zip width from functional programming languages. Uh, chapter five, we talked about the relationship between find if and lower bound and upper bound and how partition can be used to implement reverse if. And last but not least, in chapter six, we talked about the relationship between is sorted, is sorted until, adjacent find, and mismatch, and all of the algorithms that implicitly have a zip in them. Um, so thank you. <laughs>